gives me really great pleasure to introduce Marla Spearback, who's going to be talking to us tonight about propolis. And um, I was talking to her earlier. She <clears throat> she's a bit of an outdoor girl, I think, from what I <laughs> from what she was saying. Um, when she's not messing about with bees, she likes to do gardening and um, and work, walking out on her bike. And in this sort of weather, she likes to be out on her skis. Um, so very, you know, an outdoor girl. She's been to the UK a couple of times, I think, and was at the spring convention where I think she was a very popular speaker. And uh, she's now going to talk to us about propolis. Um, just before Marla starts, I, I would say that um, Marla isn't charging the Central Association for a fee tonight, um, but she has requested that perhaps if people feel so moved, they might like to make a donation to her, her lab. And there is a link posted on our website, which you can go to, and uh, I hope that you might feel inclined to do that. So um, I think that's about all I wanted to say. And uh, I shall now hand over to you, Marla. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. And good evening, everybody, although it's the middle of the afternoon for me. Um, I love listening to your accents. It's just music <laughs> to my ears. <laughs> and hello, everybody. I rec maybe recognize some uh, names. I kind of went through the participant list. Um, Hi, John Hill, for example, and others from Ireland, and um, I was, I spoke to the Somerset group last year. Um, thank you for having me again. And uh, Bob asked that I talk about propolis, but, or propolis, however you pronounce it, um, and give some new data. And I will preface this whole thing by saying from the time of COVID until now, our research progress has been slowed down considerably. And I hope you understand why that is. We were not able to get into the lab at all. Um, and then when we did, supply chains were really low. So we run a lot of PCR analyses in the lab. And of course, all PCR supplies are being used to test us for people for COVID. <laughs> so it's been a little crazy. Just today, we got 10 packages finally, and we can get going again. It's quite exciting. So I'm going to share my screen. And um, that's okay. Great, okay. Hopefully if you've heard all or portions of this talk, you'll learn something new today. <laughs> and again, I'm talking about propolis. This is our uh, B-Lab website, blab.umn.edu. And on the giving page is the place where if you're so inclined, you could make a research donation. But of course, that's totally up to you. So bees collect propolis. And in the scientific community, we consider that a form of social immunity. Social immunity was a term uh, coined by Sylvia Kremer from Austria in 2007 in her lab, where she studies ants and how ants keep themselves healthy. And it applies to all social insects, so not only ants and honeybees, but also termites and some of the social wasps. And it's defined by their behaviors or organizational strategies or other mechanisms that they use to defend themselves against parasites to maintain health of the colony. Of course, if you live, as we're all understanding now, in densely populated societies like an ant colony or a honeybee colony, the risk of disease transmission is quite high. So the study of social immunity is what these social animals do to prevent disease transmission. How do they keep themselves healthy? And that's a topic that I've been interested in for a very long time. What's the healthcare, what's the social healthcare system of the honeybee colony? And that's not a political statement. <laughs> Of course, bees have their own individual immune systems. They're different than ours because they do not produce antibodies, so they don't have that long-term memory. But they do have cellular responses where they're able to recognize microbes, foreign microbes, and encapsulate them or phagocytize, eat them up. They have humoral responses, which are um, production of 
proteins, these antimicrobial peptides that I'll talk about later, uh, or melanization, which is like a, a wound healing response. So their immune systems are quite good, um, robust even, even though they're very small individuals. But what I'm interested in is what happens when all of those thousands of individuals come together as a colony and their social immunity and what the behaviors, what are the, the behaviors they perform to keep themselves healthy. Because it turns out the behaviors of individual bees, what they're doing is analogous to cells within the immune system. So if a bee can encapsulate um, a hive beetle, for example, or some other animal or intruder that gets into the nest, if they encapsulate it with propolis or resin, that's a form of behavioral defense that would be very similar to the cellular response of encapsulation. And it just goes on from there. So one of their behavioral defenses just comes to them naturally, their division of labor, labor where instead of it's a form of social distancing, if you will. So the foragers being a different age and spending time at a different area of the nest or outside are not in as much contact with the nurse bees that are down in the brood nest. So just naturally, because of their uh, division of labor and task specialization, they don't always encounter each other. So that in that way, just their organization and spatial segregation helps reduce disease transmission. Hygienic behavior or the detection and removal of diseased and mite parasitized, parasitized brood is another form of social immunity that I've studied quite a bit. But today I'm gonna to be focusing on resin collection or propolis collection as a form of social immunity. And my goal in, in this talk is to convince all of you to just love propolis. However you pronounce the word, I want you to love it. I know it's sticky and it's all over every article of clothing that I own um, and it won't come out, but um, just know that it's good for bees and I'll, I'll explain why. So first some terms because it, it's a little confusing. Resin is produced by some plants. It's plants, that produce resins do so to defend themselves. So it's a plant defense. So some plants produce these resins, um, they secrete these resins um, to protect them from herbivory, to protect them from UV, but mostly these resins are highly, highly antimicrobial. So antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral even. And they'll protect, protect the plant from diseases. Honeybees and some other bees, but not so many others, uh, find these plants that produce resin and scrape the resin off of the plant. And this picture on the left is actually one from Brazil where a bee is scraping a green resin, you can see it on her hind legs, off of the leaves, off of the leaves of a plant called Dracuncafolia, Bacchorus Dracuncafolia, which is, um, we have some baccarat species here in the US and I imagine you have some there. We common name is rabbit brush, for example, is one form of baccarat. Anyway, so they scrape these resins off the plant, carry them on their back legs back to the nest. And there, the resins are so sticky, the bees cannot remove them themselves. So other nest mates help pull the resin off of the hind legs of the forager, like in this other, the third photo in. You can see a, bull, a bee pulling with her mandibles the, the resin load off of the bee. And then they cement those resins into the nest cavity where we call it propolis. So originally, we did, beekeepers didn't know that propolis was plant resin. They, they knew there was, even from biblical times, they were harvesting propolis from bee colonies and they gave it the name propolis, but they didn't actually know that the chemistry where it, what it was or where it came from. And so resins and propolis are actually fairly synonymous words. As far as we know, bees are not changing the chemical composition of resin. They do add beeswax to it. 
there's some research, one research paper that showed they added a little chemical secretion into the resin from their salivary glands. But when the, um, the chemists, I am not one, but when chemists analyze resin from trees and resin or propolis from the nest, they are the same chemistries. So it's not really modified as far as we know when bees bring it into the colony. And these are some other photos of bees that were collecting red, red resin um, and starting to cement it into the nest as propolis. In a natural tree cavity, bees line the interior all around their combs with a layer of propolis, which Tom Seeley in 1985 called a propolis envelope. When he was looking at feral colonies in upstate New York, um, he, he found this to be true. And what you're looking at on the left is a tree that bees nested in that was taken down in our, in our where I live in Minneapolis. And we opened it up. And so the right-hand photo is that same tree on the left, the bee tree that was opened up. And we removed the cones so that we could see this propolis lining. And you can see that dark stained area below that red dotted line is the propolis envelope. And it was contiguous and it went all the way around all of the combs throughout the colony. Above the propolis envelope, you could see some molds growing inside the tree cavity and below it that not. So that shows you right off some of the antimicrobial properties of that propolis lining. Again, on that same tree on the left, the looking out the front doors, if you are a bee looking out your front door and look, and the combs were removed again, but you can see that kind of thick layer of propolis, especially by the entrance, which you've probably seen as beekeepers, where some colonies just plug up the entrances with propolis, creating small holes, entrance holes. And curiously, in our beekeeping equipment, <laughs> in our bees here in the United States, we rarely see any propolis in the inside of the bee boxes, presumably because they're plain smooth. They do tend to put propolis in the cracks and crevices, and of course, under the frame rests uh, where the frames hang and between the boxes, making it difficult for beekeepers to manage a colony. And uh, of course, we have to use a hive tool to pry boxes apart and to get the combs up because of these sticky resins. Um, it was recently put, pointed out to me and shown to me that in colony, some colonies in the UK, the inside of a plywood box was coated with a very thin layer of propolis. So maybe some bees collect and are able to put or like to put the propolis on a smooth surface, but I really have not seen that in our colonies, especially here. Uh, some colony, it's a genetic trait, some call it, well, all bees collect propolis, but some collect more than others. And so in that way, it's heritable trait, you could select for it. And some colonies put a lot of propolis in cracks in the equipment. In that left-hand photo, you can see it just oozing out on a warm day. And the entrance um, during the fall where bees, like I said, close up the entrance, except for a few bee heads width worth, um, they can entomb or encapsulate hive beetles on the lower right, where they'll put propolis, they'll just entomb the beetles in propolis and keep them prisoners, which is a nice thing to see. And the bottom middle photo is a mouse skull that got coated with propolis. This mouse got stuck in the colony or went into the colony it, some winter must have died and the bees were able to remove most of the parts, but the skull got wedged in there. So instead of removing it, they just uh, propolized it over and, you know, it's, it's entombed like a little pharaoh there, right? In the, it was in the colony. In fact, that mouse is sitting behind me on that ledge right there, <laughs> one of my prized possessions. We don't know how much resin or propolis, I'm going to use those words interchangeably, how much resin is incorporated into wax combs. So in a feral colony where they do attach the combs to the wall, to the tree, you do see propolis like shown in this left and in the center photo. You do see a lot of the resin or propolis, uh, especially lining the rims of the cells. But as you get more toward the interior of the combs, you don't tend to see it. In the brood combs, they do turn darker with age. 
I don't know what that is. I assumed it was just where, but maybe it, there is some propolis within those uh, the brood combs. Um, I guess it remains to be determined by future research. Um, I'll come to this again later, but um, one way that we trap or collect propolis is to use a propolis trap. And I don't know if in the UK they sell this similar kind of trap. It has seven millimeter gaps and the width of the whole plastic trap is over seven millimeters. I'm not quite sure how deep it goes, but you put it on top of a colony like the one shown here on the right. And, and on top of that, we'll put this uh, rim. It's about an inch and a half with these holes drilled in. I'm not sure you can see my pointer, but with these holes, oh, sorry, drilled in, and then we would put the cover on top of this rim, letting air and wind in through those holes. And that bees really, as, as you know, don't like that sun and wind exposure. So they tend to close up those gaps with propolis. And that's one way you can collect it. And of course, these traps, we take them off, we have to freeze them very hard in order to twist them to get the propolis out. Um, they're not the most efficient, but that's one way that we trap propolis, and I'll come back to that later. For many reasons, and it, partly because I spent some time in Brazil where propolis is commonly used for human medicine, and they're very interested in it for bee health in Brazil, and partly because people in the medical school here at the University of Minnesota became interested in propolis as an alternative cure for human HIV and they found that it was active against human HIV in cell culture in the laboratory, um, but not in on real people that they did any tests on anyway. And because of that, I thought, wow, this is amazing stuff. Um, why isn't anybody really looking at the benefits of propolis to be health? So the students that are shown in the pictures below um, these comprise the, the work, these questions I've listed comprise their PhD or master's degree work over the last 10 or so years. And we, in general, ask these questions. What are the plant sources of resin in our area? What's the benefit of a have to bees of having a propolis envelope? Does it help them reduce the disease load? How does it affect their microbiome? Because of all the antimicrobial properties, would it kill off the beneficial bacteria in and on bees? And do, so, do colonies social medicate? In other words, if they're sick, do they, bring, do they go and collect more resin? Are they going to the pharmacy to get more medicine, basically? So I'll go through these, um, some more in depth than others. Mike Wilson and I, uh, he did, you know, amazing work for his PhD in collaboration with some plant chemists, and I'm giving him one slide in this talk. So Mike um, found that in our area, bees collected their propolis, most of the propolis was coming from populus trees, anything in the genus populus. So in our area, Eastern cottonwood trees, Populus deltoides was the major source of resin. And I don't know if you have cottonwood trees in your area or any uh, maybe balsam poplar, but if you go to those trees and um, snip off some of the leaves that are just growing, you can smell them. And they, at, at least for us, they smell just like our colonies. It's quite amazing, the resin smell coming from these trees. So, the way he did it was to collect the resin loads off individual bees and then climb trees and took leaves and got the resin from the leaves and then compared them using um, LCMS or liquid chromatography followed by mass spectrometry. So again, this is all the chemistry. Even though there are many con conifers in our area, pine and spruce and fir, we did not see that bees were collecting any propolis from any of the conifer trees in our area, which was a surprise to me. All right, to start to answer the other questions, um, what's the benefit of having a propolis envelope? We had to create a propolis envelope in our hive boxes. So the first method we did was to make an extract. 
and we dissolved propolis in 75% uh, ethanol and to make a tincture or an extract. And then we created a 15% solution and painted it inside of small nucleus boxes. So the one on the left, the top left there, is just the ethanol as a control in case that has antimicrobial properties. And the middle box is the propolis from Brazil, that green propolis from the Baccarus uh, species. And the one on the right, the orangish one, was propolis from our area from Populus deltoides. So we just simply made, we just painted the propolis extract along the walls and then put bees in them. And then I'll tell you about the experiments later, but that's the first experimental design. That was Mike Simon Finstrom, he did that work. When Renata Borba came along as a PhD student, she wanted to uh, create a more natural propolis envelope. And instead of collecting propolis, making an extract and painting it on, she wanted to study what happens when bees had the propolis that they were bringing in. So we took those propolis traps and cut them and stapled them inside our bee boxes. I don't recommend you do this because it really messes up the bee space, makes it very hard to get the frames out unless you really go down to eight or nine frames. But the bees did stuff those cracks up with propolis. And if you remove the traps, the photo on the right shows what the propolis envelope looked like after a short period of time. For our experiments, we kept the traps in there so that bees would continue to deposit propolis. And in this way, Renata looked at the, the benefits or the effects on bees of having that uh, nat quote, natural propolis envelope for you know, years at a time. So the, one of the things we did, and this has to do with, does it help them um, combat diseases? Does it lower their disease load? We took using Mike Simone's method where the colonies were had a painted on propolis envelope, we challenged some of those colonies with chalk brood. So we gave, we made them sick. So we would collect chalk brood mummies and we you homogenize them and mix them into a pollen substitute or pollen patty and feed it to the bees. And that's a very good way to give bees chalk brood. Don't do it. <laughs> but for our experiments, that's what we did. We challenged, and this is a small experiment, we challenged six colonies. Well, we challenged 12 colonies with chalk brood. Six of those had a propolis extract envelope and the other six did not. And after two weeks, we just simply went through the combs and counted the mummies and found that if they had the envelope, on average, they had 15 mummies. And if they didn't, on average, they had 100, over 100 mummies. So this showed us that, wow, this is not curing the disease, but it's really reducing the amount of disease within the colony. So it's not necessarily a cure, but it's certainly helping. In another experiment, sorry, I'm going, here we go. Renata's experiment, when she had uh, the propolis traps within the colonies, she challenged the colonies with American fowl brood disease. And of course, after we did this, make them sick with uh, American fowl brood, we had to burn all the colonies at the end of the season. But what she did to challenge them was to take a sucrose solution with a known number of Pennybacillus larvae spores in them and just spray every comb with spores, this sugar spore solution on the cones, present it to colonies that have a propolis envelope or not. And then we, um, they all got American fowl brood, predictably. And then we would go through and quantify, give each one a severity score. So did they have a few number of, of uh, scale or, or signs of American fowl brood, uh, anywhere between five and 20 per frame or over 20 was a severe score. So anything over two in this measurement is a very severe case of American fowl brood where you just every frame, most of the larvae are infected. And a, a severity score of one is a very low infection under five cells infected per frame. I mean, they're still sick, you still have to burn them, <laughs> but it's a lower infection. And we found the colonies in this darker color here are those with the propolis envelope. And yes, they were sick, but their, their American fowl brood, the signs 
were the disease load was significantly lower than if they did not have a propolis envelope. So again, as with chalk brood showing that just the presence of the propolis envelope helped reduce the disease load. And I should add, these colonies we used were not hygienic, so they didn't have their own behavioral mechanism of resistance to American fowl brood or chalk brood. So these were susceptible colonies. So it helps with those two diseases. It helps reduce the disease load. And we were also looking at the bees' immune response. Um, so it's, it, immune response is interesting. The immune response in bees is a very costly system. It is for all organisms. If your immune system is activated, it's at some cost to you, okay? So it's not always a good thing to have an activated immune system. It is if you're made sick, you wanna see your immune system be activated and produce antibodies or antimicrobial peptides or encapsulation. But if you're not sick, having an elevated immune response comes at some other cost to you. Okay, so you may not live as long. It may have other effects on your physiology. So it's the same with bees. So we were thinking that bees in a pro that have a propolis envelope, that propolis should be killing off the microbes within the nest cavity so that bees can, don't have to activate their immune systems. And we did a number of experiments, and I'm just showing you data from one of them that Renata Borba did over time and in, in using the propolis traps within the colonies to create a natural propolis envelope. And the graphs you're looking at are different antimicrobial peptides or immune responses from the bees that we can measure using real-time PCR. We're looking at transcript abundance for these immune-related genes. And again, the darker color bars are lower in every instance, even if they're going up or down, they're always lower than the gray bars showing that bees that have a propolis envelope, their immune system is not as activated as bees from colonies without a propolis envelope. And we can see this over and over in many colonies and in addition to having a lower immune response, which in this case is a good thing, their immune systems that was let were less variable over the season. So they're expending less energy in their immune system over time. Again, our hypothesis for how what's going on is that the bees are not having to invest as much in their immune response because the antimicrobial properties of that propolis envelope was reducing the opportunistic and pathogenic, pathogenic disease-causing microbes in the nest. This is a good thing. The analogy I like to give sometimes is that I have a uh, allergy to mold. So I'm sitting in my office at work and um, this, I'm in a new office, but my old office had a lot of mold in it. And I would just sit in my office and sneeze all day long. And I imagine if you measured my immune response, it would be highly elevated when I was sitting in my office. I was very tempted and I wanted to paint the walls of my office with propolis, my old office. And that would have killed all the molds. And I imagine I would have stopped sneezing. And if you would have measured my immune system in this hypothetical, <laughs> it was real and I did have a mold allergy there then if you measure my immune system, it would be quieter again. And so that's, I think, what's going on with the bees. And in fact, that's where I got the <laughs> ideas sitting in my office, having a response to mold. Okay. Okay, so highly antimicrobial, that's, that's great. But you know, bees do have beneficial microbes. And if they're constantly surrounded by this antimicrobial layer, what does that do to them? Now, as far as we know, bees are not consuming propolis directly. At the very end of this talk, I'm gonna show you a way they may be coming in contact with compounds from the propolis, but they're not eating the resin directly. Can you imagine that would getting stuck in their mouth parts? <laughs> it would gum up their works, I imagine. 
But we were interested in just, does it affect their external or internal, their gut microbiome? So on the right is a diagram of the uh, digestive tract, the bee, the crop, the uh, stomach, the intestines, and the, and the rectum. And each of those niches within the digestive system has its core bacterial species. We don't know much about the fungal species yet, but we know a lot, well, we know somewhat about the core bacterial micro, microbial communities in the bee. And we're able to identify which bacteria are the core ones, which we consider beneficial. And we found that bees in colonies that have this propolis envelope, their core gut microbe communities were more abundant and they had fewer opportunistic or pathogenic microbes um, in bees with a propolis envelope. So here's an example of the data. And each of these columns running up and down is an individual bee. And you're looking at different kinds of bacteria signified by these different colors. You can see on the left, bees from propolis poor colonies, those without a propolis envelope, had highly variable bacteria, lots of different kinds of bacteria. But in a propolis rich colony, they had more, they were more stable. They were more, um, the abundances were different and the diversity was lower, which we were not in this particular experiment, we could identify some of the bacteria, but not all of them. And this gave us the first indication that it's, it's actually helping the gut microbiome instead of hurting it. Then we took it a step further by just looking at the microbiome of the mouth parts. You have to remember that bees micro and ours also, our microbiomes are not only inside of us, but they're all over us, they're on our skin and everywhere. <laughs> and bees, of course, their mouth parts have bacteria all over them. And for this, we were collaborating with Dr. Kirk Anderson, shown on the bottom left here. He's a microbiome specialist at a USDA uh, ARS research lab in Arizona. So why the mouth parts? It's because bees get their mouths into everything, right? So bees, uh, when they forage, they put their proboscis into flowers, their mandibles help them, you know, collect food. Inside the nest, they're feeding larvae with their mouth parts. They're touching the queen and licking the queen with their mouth parts. They're sharing food through trophallaxis with each other. Their mouths come in contact with everything. So we were curious. So the propolis um, may affect the mouth part microbiome. And here's one of those uh, uh, so those crazy graphs again, <laughs> this time shown horizontally. But on the top are, are bees from colonies, individual bees shown here that are from a colony with a propolis envelope or without. And again, bees from colonies with that propolis envelope had more core microbacteria on their mouth parts and less of the other bacteria. So the three core species shown here on the right, Umbella apis, Lactobacillus conchii, and Fructobacillus fructosus, and those colors I wrote it in are basically the same colors in this, in this graph. Those had increased. And in the next graph, we could identify those other bacteria, those that are disease causing or just opportunistic, just there. And you can see on average, on the left here, colonies with the propolis envelope had those three core mouth part microbiomes shown now in green in very high abundance. And the blues are those other pathogenic bacteria or opportunistic. In contrast, bees from colonies without a propolis envelope had lower abundance of the good um, core bacteria and higher abundance of the others. So again, this is helping us show that the bacteria, uh, the, I'm sorry, the propolis is killing off or reducing the, uh, the microbes the, that are opportunistic and pathogenic, allowing the core microbiome to grow. Of course, bees have evolved with propolis, 
So we think that those core microbiome species within the gut and on the bee are probably resistant to the effects of the antimicrobial properties of propolis. So summarizing so far, the propolis envelope provides a therapeutic defense against chalk brood and AFB pathogens, foul brood pathogens. It helps everyday help to their immune systems. We did not see it had any effect on varroa mites, on nosema loads, or on viruses, unfortunately. However, other researchers have observed some effects of propolis on varroa in, only in the laboratory. They can't get it, that doesn't seem to work in a colony yet. And a little bit on virus levels. And I hope, I'm hoping that other people in other labs are looking at this more carefully. Um, what we're doing for virus levels, and it's really difficult, and this is the research that came to a, a full stop during <laughs> the last two years. We have a cell line made from honeybee cells that we can grow in the laboratory and that we can passage and keep growing with cell medium. So um, just like the cell line from Henrietta, the human cell line from Henrietta Lacks that is used in human medicine to develop vaccines for many human diseases, we're, we were able to develop a honeybee cell line so that we can study the effects of diseases on just the cell, which helps us reduce all the variation that happens in a bee and in a colony and in, in, in um, outside in environmental effects. And our cell line, curiously, is has a persistent infection of DWV type A, which is very, very interesting. And yet the cell line lives with this. But we're able to, now we know that it has DWV, we can inoculate the cell line with acute, acute bee paralysis virus, which is a much more lethal virus to bees, we think, than DWV. And we can do them in combination. We can even put in DWV type B or other viruses into the cell and um, subject the cells to exposure to propolis or not. And we're doing this in various ways, either through the volatile exposure or contact exposure in a way that's not toxic to the cells. And we're starting to see some immediate effects on acute bee paralysis virus, at least in cell culture. So that's good news. And I, I wish we had more to report on this, but stay tuned. We're coming back to life here. <laughs> so as COVID goes that way, our research on viruses can come back in. Okay, so moving to the last question, do, do bees increase their resin foraging after they're made sick, after we challenge them with, um, ask us, with chalk brood or with American fowl brood, fungal or bacterial pathogens, do they send out more foragers to collect more, quote, medicine? Are they self-medicating? And it's more properly called social medicating because it's a benefit for the colony, not necessarily for the individual bee. So these are kind of fun experiments to do. Um, we set up a bunch of these small nucleus colonies. You're looking at, the woman is Renata Borba, a PhD student. We put them up on these stands. And to begin with, we just closed the colonies um, twice a day for two weeks and counted the number of resin foragers and pollen foragers returning to the colony every day. So we just had an idea of how much resin and, and pollen they were collecting in, in these short time periods. And then when we understood that, then we challenged the colonies with either chalk brood or American fowl brood. And then when they were sick, we started our observations again every two weeks, twice a day, counting the number of resonant pollen foragers. And these are just some of the data. It was very, very interesting. If you challenge a colony with a fungal pathogen, chalk brood, that's shown in this light gray bar, A. apis, Ascospera apis, they do increase resin foraging after they're sick. So this shows the number of resin foragers after minus before the challenge, the relative increase in resin foraging. If we challenge them with American fowl brood, Pennybacillus larvae, they increased a few, but not significantly different than the controls that were not challenged at all. So if they're challenged with a fungal pathogen, they increase resin foraging, but not with a bacterial pathogen. And 
I made the students repeat this three or four times because I didn't understand it, but it was the same every time we did it. So it's just a mystery. I guess the bees are entitled to have some of their mysteries. <laughs> I hope to figure it out someday, but I don't understand why. Okay, so moving on, what does all this mean for beekeepers? How can we stimulate our bees to create a natural propolis envelope? So hopefully your bees, maybe uh, Apis mellifera mellifera, if that's the kind of bee you use, maybe they collect a lot of resin and stick and apply it to the inside of a smooth beekeeping box. This box on the left, we, wrote, we roughed up with a wire brush and they did apply some propolis, not as much as if we put in a, a whole propolis trap like that. So we were trying to figure out how can we stimulate bees to create a propolis envelope naturally? What kind of box do they need to have? So we're working with a guy who mills his own lumber and he's created these boxes where the outside is smooth, but the interior is very rough and it's grooved. It's grooved as deep as the propolis trap is thick, even more. And you can see the grooves are very, very rough. So it simulates more closely what the inside of a, bee, of a tree, which is very rough and craggy, right? And when we give the bees our bees, which don't tend to collect even very much propolis, <laughs> when we give them to them, they do stuff those cracks with propolis, as you can see in this right-hand photo. So we took these boxes, we had him made 60 of them, and uh, well, 120, so he could put two deeps on. And we took him to a commercial beekeeper who has a migratory operation. And he put those boxes on 60 colonies. And then the other 60 were just regular smooth in interior boxes. And he took the bees on his full mi trans migratory route from Mississippi to South Dakota for honey production and over to almonds in California. And this is when we sampled them. So we just tracked those boxes and those colonies as they did their migratory route through the US, sampling the bees at various times. And we found that the bees in colonies with a propolis envelope, again shown in these darker bars, had slightly larger populations as measured by frames of bees and total population. Not by much. It was, in this case, barely significant and you know, significantly different. Fortunately, there was no difference in honey production. So this was a question that beekeepers had been asking me. If we encourage them to make propolis, will it reduce their honey production? And this is um, not the full data set even. This is um, 51 and 53. Of course, some of the colonies were lost. But honey production was the same whether they had that rough interior or not. So that's, that's good news. And that was a pretty good honey harvest, honey, 140 pounds. And their immune systems, we, we looked at those two. And again, from the propolis rich colonies, their immune systems were not as activated and shown in this red bar on the left and less variable. All of this different spread is the difference in the measurements, the ranges. And you can see on the right-hand graph, the, as the propolis score, the more propolis they brought in, the, this, this is an antimicrobial peptide and a, a basin. The more propolis they had, the less a basin expression we were measuring. So their immune systems, again, were quieter, showing that we're getting there in these commercial boxes. Interestingly, and these are the last two slides, May Birnbaum, who's, I have a lot of respect for May Birnbaum. She's quite an amazing researcher and she studies phytochemicals or plant compounds in nectar and in pollen. And she wrote a review article on honey recently. And in that she reports of the main phytochemicals or plant compounds reported in honey in Northern latitudes, these compounds, pinobanxin, pinosembrin, quercetin, chrysin, and galligan, were not, or few of these were found in nectar. They're in honey, but they're not in nectar. All of them are common in propolis. And she surmises that although propolis is not known to be ingested, the resin not known to be ingested, 
the fact that common constituents of propolis are shared in honey suggests that ingesting honey may be how bees are getting the benefit of the propolis because probably the honey is being infused with some of the propolis compounds, especially those that were listed on that previous slide. So they're not ingesting it per se, but they're getting the benefit of it through this infusion process, through the volatiles or maybe the contact. All right, so I wanna thank uh, the trees for producing resins and the bees for collecting them and all of my students for all of the great work and funding sources and you for inviting me and I hope you love propolis. Let's hear about it. So I'll, I'll take your questions now. Um, I think I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see and see the chat if there is any. And yeah, see who really is. Have <laughs> Thank you. Yes, there's some, there's some good questions up here, um, some of which you answered a bit later on, but um, here's a good one from Larry. Um, Our old hive bodies with years of properly supplied to services, a healthier environment for bees. And, and a follow up question, could we apply propolis to new equipment to give the colony a head start? Right. The first question, I'm sorry, I missed it. Does it make them healthier? Yes. Yes, I think it does. I think all of our data show that having exposure to this propolis envelope or a lot of propolis in the nest, the more the better. Yes. It really helps them keep themselves healthy. One of the things and, that we tend to do with older equipment is, is to it. sterilize it. Yes, scrape it and blow lamp it. And <laughs> I guess yes. we, we undo a lot of the good doing that. I think, I think we do. And could we paint propolis on? Yes, you can, but it's easier to let the bees do it themselves. That's why we went to the rough boxes. Because when you're getting propolis from somewhere else, you have to, do, uh, you have to make an extract. And depending on the kind of alcohol you use or ethanol you use, you're gonna take out some of the active components of the propolis in the extract. So it's better to let them bring in their own local and natural propolis They'll keep adding it over the season. The antimicrobial properties will change a little bit because plant chemistries are incredibly complicated. And so they keep changing. There's many, many compounds and they keep changing in relevant, relative abundance over the season. So we prefer to let the bees do it. Um, I was just going to ask Greg, um, where are we? I've lost him. Uh, <laughs> How? I don't know. Hey, hey, are we Greg, Hello. Greg Watkins. Yeah. Hello. Are you there? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Just, I just made an observation about the name propolis. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of it, but just to remind people that it comes from Greek, pro being in front of and polis meaning city. Because um, in a Particularly in a wild colony, bees often make a curtain in front of the entrance to the hive. So they're making a, a barrier in front of the city, hence propolis or yeah. propolis. Yeah, it's protecting the city. It's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Anna, would you like to pose your question? Oh, hi. Um, my question is regarding the resin foragers and whether, um, I'm just going to, um, yeah, so whether the foragers, the resin foragers are specialized foragers, like the ones who um, gather and, and collect water, or whether exposing them to the pathogen, exposing the colony, colony to pathogens, which is that resin foraging on, and whether, you know, other foragers then start to collect resins. Right. So we have not done that work. In fact, Tom Seeley had a postdoc from Japan, Nakamura, who did has a very nice paper on this. And he shows that um, resin foragers also can and do forage for pollen and nectar, you know, on, on different foraging flights. And so um, they're just normal foraging age bees, but some of them for some reason will go wake up one morning and say, it's a resin day for me, I guess. I don't know how they make these decisions, <laughs> but they go and uh, collect resin, but it doesn't, they're not completely specialized. They would collect 
nectar and pollen on other days, and that has been documented. And I suppose if more resin is needed, like after this challenge with chalk brood, um, some foragers would either switch or the what we call unemployed bees, because you know most of the bees in the colony are idle, not doing anything. <laughs> Don't tell your neighbors that, but <laughs> they think bees are always busy and many of them are not. But I think some of those get recruited into foraging for resin. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. And um, Pam, Pam Hunter. Just unmuting myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Marla. That was interesting. I'm feeling cross at having not looked up some work that I heard presented, I think it was at, in Belfast at the European Congress, and somebody from Eastern Europe, whose name of course I can't remember, talked about propolis. And you'll be interested to know that the top plant everywhere is poplar, as it is in this country. We don't have the same poplars that you do, mm. but that is way in ahead the major plant for producing propolis, fascinating. And I'm pretty sure she also showed that Pinus was lower than we might expect. And there were various other, other trees as well. But the other point I want to make, which you did touch on slightly because natural products is, is one of my fields, because a lot of people say, oh, can't we extract? And of course, as I'm sure you know, but others may not, natural products are horribly variable. So you just get this amazing mix of compounds and chemicals. She did list a number of chemicals that were the commonest, but that's all. They vary so much from individual trees, from species, from parts of the country, time of the year, that it becomes almost impossible to say, oh, this is the compound, let us extract it. Uh, would, would you agree with that? I completely agree. And it sounds like the woman was Vasya Benkova from Bulgaria. That's it. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> she's quite an amazing, she's, she's the lead propolis scientist and chemist. She's yes. miles ahead of all of us. And um, her work is quite, quite good and quite amazing. So yes. Yes, she would. Yes, you said it properly, and I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think Lombardy pop poplar is the one that we get most ah. in in the UK, and it, it it does have a really characteristic odor. You walk down an avenue of of Lombard poplar, and uh, you can smell it definitely. I looked up uh, Baccaris. Um, there's only one species listed in um, Stace, uh, oh. the UK book, uh, tree groundsel. Uh, Baccaris halimifolia, um, yeah, so it's a uh, Asteraceae family, isn't it? Yeah, um, where are we? Uh, Charlie uh, says, what, what an awesome presentation, agreed. Uh, what are your next steps in your research? Well, we're deep into this virus world <laughs> <laughs> in all senses of that word, I guess. Um, but I'm also, we are breeding uh, a new line of bees here, and um, mostly for varroa and virus resistance, but I'm also looking for colonies that do collect a lot of propolis. So those colonies that have the lowest mite growth over the season and that collect a lot of propolis stay in the game, so um, stay in the breeding program. So we're at about two years into that program, and um, we'll see that where that takes us. Okay, thank you. Um, Adam, Adam Bagnall has a good question. Yeah, I was just wondering if um, you could sort of glue or staple sheets of a very coarse sandpaper into the hive. It would have less of a bee space impact than the, the propolis traps. Oh. Um, but also potentially, like we've got movable frames, they could then become movable propolis sheets you do a split you take your couple of frames and a couple of sheets of propolis with it right yes go for it so <laughs> i one thing i love about you all at beekeepers you beekeepers is that you're so innovative you always come up with great ways to do things so i 
I hope that you go in that direction. We've put in window screens, we've put in, you know, the, the, the little plastic bags that hold onions, you know, things like that, that have uh, very, you know, anything. Put them in the colony. Sometimes the bees, if they're too loose plastic, they just tear them to shreds. But others, maybe like very coarse sandpaper, would be good alternatives if the bees can't um, tear it up. So go experiment with all of these things. It's, of course, easier than buying new boxes that are specially made <laughs> <laughs> or trying to take a wire brush or some kind of refurbish or roughen up your, your current boxes. So yes, it would be wonderful to have some kind of an insert um, that you could move around that would not interfere with the bee space. It's a wonderful idea. Good one. Uh, Pam, Pam Hatton. Or is it Hello, Marla, thank you very much for your talk. You're um, we understood that it was the older bees that collected propolis because it's so sticky, you know, it can destroy the pollen basket. Mm. It is the not found bees. that. No, that is the older bees. It is the foraging age bees, yeah. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Pat O'Halloran. You there? I'll read it out then. She says lead contamination has been a problem in propolis tincture sold in health shops. Yep. Is it a problem for the bees and where does it come from? Oh, the dirty underbelly. Here we go. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I am not doing research on this, but Mike Simon Finstrom, who was my former student, who's now at a researcher at a USDA lab, they are looking not at uh, lead or heavy metal contamination, but they're looking at pesticide contamination in propolis because it is sticky and it does absorb these compounds, you know, heavy metals and pesticides. Um, what he's found is yes, you can find some of the pesticides. We doesn't, like I said, he doesn't have measures of the metals, but some of the pesticides, um, especially an herbicide, get absorbed into the propolis, but to all of their experiments to date on the bees show no effect. And I'm hoping that when he finishes that data, um, I know he'll share some of those graphs with me so I can show them with you. But to date, no effect on the bees. I think because unlike pollen and nectar, they're really not consuming the propolis directly. You know, they're not ingesting it. It seems to be in, trapped within the matrix of the propolis. So maybe um, they're not getting that exposure even though it's in there. Mm. It may be, if, if there is a lot, it may be a good reason to scrape it off periodically and let them bring in new, um, but we really, really don't know. And of course, for human use, like the lead, lead contamination in the propolis, we're consuming it directly. And that would not be the case for bees. Some beekeepers are saying, hey, well, let's make a propolis sugar solution and feed it to them. And because, well, I, I really don't suggest that anybody do this. It's a powerful antibiotic. And because there may be some contamination in it, you really don't want to feed it to them directly or try to get it in solution to feed it to them. Mm. Okay. Well, look, um, I'll just take a couple more questions and then I think we'll uh, let you take a break. Um, I've, I've got a, one from Anastasia here. Would you like to pose your question, Anastasia? No. No, she's, she asks whether you'd thought of, of making beehives out of popular wood, populous wood, um, creating a lot I wonder if there's resin in the wood itself. I don't, no, I don't know. I don't, no, no. Um, yeah, don't know. Okay. <laughs> Any suggestions for encouraging a propolis envelope on a polyhive? Asks Greg. No. <laughs> Poly, polystyrene, I think you're talking about, right? Or, yes, yes, polystyrene. Yeah. Well, it would be the same thing. You'd have to either put in uh, some kind of screen 
whether metal or or plastic kind of screen or sand maybe rough sand very coarse sandpaper or something like that yeah i don't i i imagine maybe if you scored it up but then i'm not sure that's what you want to do to your equipment yeah. I've got another uh, last question. Roger Patterson asks, is there any evidence that colonies with higher numbers of patri lines collect more propolis? Oh. Have you looked at that one? No one, to my knowledge, I have not looked at that and I don't know that. Um, no. So you would imagine that colonies with high number of patri lines, that at least from some of those patri lines, they would have a higher tendency to collect resin to begin with. So I would imagine that you you would see that um, compared to colonies with very few petrolines or one where you just may not have that genetic tendency. Yes. I did see a question from um, Celia, Celia Davis. She had- Oh yes, yeah. oh yes, go ahead. Do you want me to ask it myself, Bob? Um, yes, yes, I was just interested uh, whether you've done any work or know of anyone else who has uh, as to whether different types of resin from different plants have different activities against different microbes. So some were active against bacteria, some might be more active against fungi. And so um, on. Yes, and I, we've done limited amount of that work, but at Vasya Bankova and others have done quite a bit of that work. Most of the, most propolis from all sources are active against many, both bacteria and fungi. Some are a little more active than others. So it's, you know, some are a little better at some of the bacteria than other bacteria, but they're usually active against all of them. So it's, it, it's quite amazing because of the diversity in compounds in these plants, the, the defenses that they're producing, they're constantly changing the chemistries and the, the abundance of their chemistries um, over time. And, and that keeps those, um, plant microbes from developing, you know, from infection and from, and from developing resistance. So the propolis is just beautiful in how the resin, I mean, in the trees is just amazing in how variable it is and how it keeps, keeps changing its game, if you will, so that the microbes can't get past it. You know, it's always gonna be effective on them. And that's what's happening in a bee colony too, which is why it's best to let the bees bring in their own. <laughs> That's lovely. Well, thanks Celia for that question. And um, thank you, Marla, very, very much for thank your you talk all. this evening. I think we've all learned to love Propolis just oh, a good. little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It's Perfect. still horribly sticky stuff, but yeah, it, it, it's, it has a good reason, good side to it. That's good. So once again, very, very many thanks. Thank you all for attending this evening. Um, I'm going to finish again with the trailer for the, um, the upcoming events. And uh, also to remind you that um, uh, any small donation to the further work that Marla is trying to um, work out in Minnesota would be gratefully received, I'm sure. So um, yeah, thanks again. Thank you to you all. Thanks particularly to Marla. Many thanks. All right. I'm going to be leaving everyone. Now, so. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>